I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run But that nuclear power's got us Fussing and fighting And I do believe it's time we was done No news! morning Toledo and good afternoon Columbus and hello to those of you listening on the internet wherever and whenever you are oh and good morning Bowling Green also uh, my name is Joe DeMar and I'm here quote unquote with my incredible co-host Rebecca Wood yes and together Rebecca and I are about to craft an hour of radio called for a green future so I have to periodically reassure the dog that everything's okay <laughs> Oh, okay. Yes. You've got a canine co-host there. Four Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment. And we talk about it in the ways that it affects you, your wealth, your health, your happiness, and the wealth and health and happiness of your friends and your families and the pets and the critters, the annelids and the invertebrates and the vertebrates and pretty much everybody and everything. Uh, because we are all wrapped up together here on this wonderful planet called Earth. And uh, we've got a good show lined up for you today. No uh, no guest this week. We're constantly looking for guests, and sometimes they just don't, we don't manage to get one in time. Already got next week's guest lined up, so that's, uh, that's good. So what we're going to do instead, well, first we're going to talk, just us folks, for about another 10 minutes or so. And uh, then we're going to have, uh, we're going to go over Nature Magazine's top 10 people of 2023, because most of them have some sort of ecological connection, because Nature is a magazine about science, and uh, science and ecology are, are connected, like, you know, intricately there. Uh, and interestingly, one of the top 10 people in Nature's uh, list is actually not a person. So that'll be something uh, interesting. Uh, then we will hear from our patrons and sponsors to whom we are incredibly grateful. And then uh, Rebecca, and what, what will you be talking about this week, Rebecca? I have chocolate and also maple syrup. Chocolate and maple syrup. Yeah, there you yes. go. There's some definite connections to the natural world there. Sweet uh, and also <laughs> sticky. <laughs> Uh, then we have uh, Ecological News, and uh, that will be our show. I wanted to start out talking a little bit about forests. Just remind people that there's a whole bunch of different types of forests. We got your tropical rainforest, mangrove forest, monsoon forest, scrub forest, temperate forest, rainforest, chaparral, deciduous, and boreal forests. Now, wow. And so... There's forests all over the world, and, and one of the most uh, heavily forested countries, believe it or not, is Japan. Uh, they they are actually... Wow. Yeah, they are 67.2% uh, forested. Um, Canada, I believe, is the most forested country in the world, which is not too surprising, given that it's huge and empty. <laughs> but the reason I wanted to bring up Japan specifically is because I, I discovered just this past week of a, a we, last week we had Vina Kali on. And Vina Kali was talking about um, 
the nuclear radiation that's contaminated the area around Piketon, Ohio. And it just got me to thinking about the idea of sacrifice zones. Japan is mostly forested, but in terms of uh, the planet, J Japanese industry actually is responsible for a lot of deforestation all over the rest of the world. And mm -hmm. so they're kind of willing to sacrifice other countries' forests for their industrial processes, even though they do protect their own forests. You know, it's just this kind of concept, this idea that you could sacrifice that area over there as long as this area here that we're in uh, is, is still okay. And of course, ecologically speaking, that is a little bit ridiculous because um, there literally is no over there. That's one of the main lessons of ecology is that we're all right here on this one planet and everything is interconnected. So all these sacrifice zones around the world are just sort of temporarily sacrifice, you know, separate because one thing about them, as we heard from uh, Veena Kali last week, is the contamination from that sacrifice zone is spreading. And I found out that there's a, a place in uh, Japan called Aomori, which had the Rokasho uh, nuclear waste recycling plant, kind of just like Piketon. And there, the uh, they have at that area, the, the, the highest death rate in the whole country of Japan. Uh, just out of curiosity, this doesn't have anything to do with the Fernalt plant, does it? Or the Fernalt, Fernalt facility? Well, Fernalt's another uh, contaminated area. It's another one of these sacrifice zones. And they're, they're all over the world. Um, the one in, in uh, Aomori, Aomori in Japan, they released two, 2,150 million, or trillion, excuse me, becquerels of tritium from 2006 to 2009. And as we know, tritium is uh, radioactively active for about 120 years. And so, you know, that, that tritium is still, you know, busily causing cancer and early deaths in, in those people in that region. Uh, Fernal also has contamination. Of course, we all know about Chernobyl, you know, that huge sacrifice zone. That's probably one of the most famous sacrifice zones in the world. But there's lots of others. Um, we've talked about Hanford in Washington State, which is considered actually to be one of the most contaminated, radioactively contaminated places in the world. But there's a, uh, another place that we talked about occasionally called Sellafield over in the UK, which is uh, competing <laughs> with Hanford. Uh, the, the contamination levels there are just incredible because again, that was a nuclear waste reprocessing area where they separated out plutonium from the um, nuclear waste from the nuclear rods from nuclear power plants. And they were uh, horribly successful because <laughs> sitting in Sellafield are tons and tons of plutonium, which no one has any idea what to do with. So they're just sitting there radiating, but the process of separating out the plutonium created this sacrifice zone that, um, you know, the, the, especially the seashore around, um, around the Sellafield plant. And it's, Sellafield's a huge sacrifice area, thousands and thousands of acres. And the seashore around there, they've tested sediments and they're just intensely radioactive. So, um, but probably one of the first ones and one of the places that created this whole idea of uh, the whole phrase sacrifice zone is called the polygon in Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. And that was a place where the Soviet Union tested their nuclear weapons and they exploded something like 250 uh, nuclear bombs in this remote area in Kazakhstan, which is now, it's uninhabitable in that the levels of radiation are so high that people who, who would live there won't live very long, but people are actually still living there. So um, 
So essentially, the idea that you could sacrifice a bunch of people in an area, whether it's for the nuclear industry or the chemical industry, there's there's chemical sacrifice zones like Cancer Alley down in Louisiana. Mining, of course, uh, has huge, incredible sacrifice zones. The, the tar sands up in Canada is a that sacrifice zone is huge enough to be seen from the International Space Station. Um, deforestation causes sacrifice zones, especially in places like rainforest, where once you cut down the forest, uh, the, the ground is so thin and the rain comes and washes away what little topsoil there is. Um, and you essentially get an, un, you know, you get a desert. And so that that is also a sacrifice zone. So the, the, I just wanted to sort of remind everybody, just sort of talk about this idea and this this way of thinking that you can, we can be okay here, even as they destroy the environment over there. And unfortunately, that's just not true, um, because eventually the, the uh, consequences of creating these sacrifice zones become global. They, they become worldwide. And uh, we actually have a couple stories in the uh, ecological news segment that talk about that. So just a quick discussion about sacrifice zones and... Uh, I yeah, that, that's it got three words for you, people, wind and water. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. The, the, they're, the, they're the planet's circulatory system and they circulate stuff. Right. Yeah. And as, as Vida told us last week, the contamination from the Piketon plant has been found in air monitors uh, 14 miles away from the original yeah. plant. And the school building that had to be uh, abandoned because it's radioactively contaminated down there, that was also about 15 miles from the plant. So, so like I say, having a, a little separate zone that you sacrifice doesn't last long because that contamination does spread out. Now, some people also have the erroneous idea that once you dilute stuff down to a certain point, uh, they don't affect you anymore. And with the, the case of radioactivity, that just simply isn't true because we found that even the lowest levels of radiation have very high uh, health effects. They cause cancer at a very high rate. So really all diluting does in, in terms of radioactivity is spread out the, <laughs> spread out the, the destruction you know it, it doesn't get rid of the destruction it just sort of moves it around and and uh there is this past week there was a huge story that uh downstream from fukushima whereas we've been reporting they've been releasing uh radioactive tritium into the pacific uh, they had a, a huge die-off of the fish uh, millions and millions of tons of fish have just been washing up on the shore downstream from Fukushima. And we don't know that what's caused the, the, that uh, die off. I mean, it's, it's unprecedented in terms of the local people have never seen a die off like this before. The official story is that it could be uh, water currents bringing cold water in or hot water. Um, or it could be some kind of deoxygen deoxygenation event, uh, but they're not checking to see if maybe some of these fish were uh, suffering from exposure to radioactivity. They're they're not testing for the radioactivity, and so all the all the guesses until you test until you actually have hard data, all the guesses are are literally just that guesses, and so. Um, at this point, I would say we can't rule out the radiation dumped by Fukushima, especially since all the studies have shown that that radiation isn't just tritium, that there are other radioactive elements that got out into that water too. So, so The thing is, normally you would want to know why if a lot of fish were dying, because 
whatever the reason, it's not good, you know. Right. <laughs> Even if it is just a lack of oxygen or some cold, hot or cold water or something. Yeah. What I and and all the news stories I've seen, they asked a couple marine biologists to make guesses, and they make guesses, but I haven't seen any sign. I, you know, the, none of the news articles I've read have said that anybody's actually like testing these fish and trying to figure out why they died. And the answer also could simply be that the Japanese government doesn't want to find out that it was, in fact, uh, you know, that radiation has is a factor in what happened. So uh, that's a an old old trick. You know, you don't you don't find anything if you don't look for it. So uh, so we'll keep an eye on that story, and if any more information comes in, uh, we'll we'll let you know. Okay, so now on to some other stuff, an interesting little thing. Yeah, Nature Magazine is one of the best magazines in the world in terms of uh, reporting on science. And, you know, they do a lot of stories on ecology. And, uh, you know, they're one of the resources I, I like to go to uh, when I want some really reliable information because, you know, it's all very carefully uh, reviewed by scientists, you know, it's peer reviewed. And if you can get an article published in Nature, you've, you know, met a very high standard. And for the past 10 years, Nature, every December, they do their uh, their top 10 uh, people who did who contributed to science in the previous year. And so uh, we're going to take a quick look at them. One, first off, uh, and, and so what I'm going to do, we don't have time to go through all 10 of them in detail. So what I'm going to do is just uh, mention the ones that aren't ecologically connected, but then I'll go into more detail on the ones that are ecologically important. So uh, one of their top 10, the first one was a woman named Kalpana Kalahasti. And uh, she was listed because she's an engineer and she's a manager. And she ran the... Uh, Indian space program that put just landed uh, a lander, the Shandarayan-3 uh, touchdown on the moon. And so uh, so that's, India is now the fourth country in the world that landed something on the moon. And it was largely thanks to this woman, Kalpana Kalahasti. Now, this next one is extremely environmentally uh, important. And her name is uh, Marina Silva, and she's in Brazil, and she's Brazil's Minister of Environment. And so when uh, Lula, when the Silva got elected uh, this past year, he immediately appointed her because he she had been his Minister of Environment during his first term. And uh, she has definitely had a huge impact reigning in the the deforestation of uh, of the Brazilian rainforest. And basically what happened was that the previous prime minister, Bolsonaro, uh, he dismantled all the protections that the Silva had put in place and logging went up 60% under Bolsonaro. But uh, in just a few months, you know, just from January of this year, to July of this year, uh, there's been a 43% drop in deforestation alerts in, in Brazil. So she's already had a, a huge impact. And uh, one interesting thing they gave a little bit of her biography is that she, what she became an environmentalist after meeting uh, Chico Mendes. And Chico Mendes was an, a, a very uh, an incredibly important environmental activist, and he was murdered back in 1988 by a rancher. So he's one of our environmental uh, martyrs. And so he set her on a course of, uh, of pursuing leadership roles, political leadership, in order to save the environment. And so, she, you know, she, she's been doing environmental activism since the 1970s. Um, then she got into politics to, in order to pursue environmental policies. She became 
Brazil's youngest senator in uh, 1994 when she was 35 years old. And she took the opportunity of getting this, uh, being picked as one of the nature's top 10 to talk about CO2 emissions because essentially she said, everything I'm doing with the Brazilian rainforest will mean nothing if we keep putting CO2 in the air because it'll, you know, it'll destroy the forest even if I stop the deforestation. So um, she thinks of herself, there's a, a tree in the Amazon that produces a, a very strong fiber that the, that the indigenous people use to, uh, and they use it in all their crafts, they use it to make their canoes and their, and their buildings. Uh, and she sees herself as one of the fibers from that, that tree. And uh, her quote is, this is how I see my work, bringing together those who are available and whatever is necessary to form a support surface in the challenging journeys of our time. So she's, so that's a cool one, Marina Silva, happy to hear from her. Katush, Katushiko Hay, Hayashi, uh, Katushiko Hayashi is a, 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 he's a biologist, a microbiologist. And the reason he's in there is he's figured out how to turn male cells into viable eggs uh, that can be fertilized. <laughs> and so, so basically what he's done is, uh, so far with mice is he's, he's created mice that have two fathers and no mother, um, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. One interesting aspect of this is that he's look, he's looking to use this, uh, to save species that are down to just a couple individuals, um, you know, so he actually right now his laboratory is working on the white rhino because there's only two northern right rhinos, northern white rhinos left in the world, uh, and unfortunately those they're both female. There are quite a few uh, right rhinos left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no shortage of them. That's true. They, yeah, and they seem to be reproducing just fine. Yeah. <laughs> so uh yeah but so it's possible that he'll he'll be able to um create new cell lines that can then be grown into new white rhinos but um but you know it's much better to not have to go that route um okay another interesting person is uh, anna critcher and she's a U.S. physicist, and she basically helped the National Ignition Facility produce uh, nuclear reactions. Um, fusion, you know, fusion's that always 20 years off thing. It's been 20 years off since the 1950s. Um, we may never need fusion, you know, if we put wind and solar in and conservation and geothermal. Um you know, we might not need this. Uh, the idea of of boundless energy, you know, because that was the original promise of nuclear fission too, that that there'd just be so much energy, you know, more than we could ever possibly do use. Um, and that this is true with the fusion too. They're promising us, you know, incredible power. And I think, you know, ecologically speaking, that's kind of a primitive way of thinking. I mean, instead of having more power than we could ever possibly use. Yeah, so so it's great this this uh, woman scientist is helping with fusion, but um, the whole pursuit of fusion itself is kind of, is a little problematic. But on to Alani Miravili. Alani Miravili, and uh, this, she is not problematic at all. In fact, she's the United Nations Chief Heat Officer. And basically she's helping protect the world from, from the, the threats of climate change. And uh, specifically, she has, her whole career has been uh, working on making cities and Athens in particular, Athens, Greece, able to better withstand climate change 
by uh, planting trees and um, you know changing the layouts of buildings and and basically doing the things that protect people in the cities from the heat of the cities. And so, yeah, she recently, uh, just before she got appointed to this position in the United Nations, uh, this past year, she she was what she personally saw the, the forest fires in Greece that we reported on. And uh, she said, this is the type of devastation you can't really replace. And this is clearly a catastrophe that we're responsible for. So what happened to her is she saw a big forest fires in 2007. And then she went on to, to head the parks department in Athens, Greece. And she used that to uh, plant thousands and thousands of trees. She, like many environmentalists, uh, is also concerned about the problem of air conditioning. Because as heat goes up, more and more people start air conditioning uh and that of course increases the demand for for energy which can produce uh more greenhouse gases and create that like positive feedback loop i i remember there was a a heat wave way back in the clinton administration down in texas and people were actually dying by the thousands and so what Clinton did was he used federal funds and he bought, you know, tens of thousands of air conditioners and shipped them to Dallas. And I was thinking, you know, yeah, it's good for the moment, but actually that would kind of make the problem worse in the long run. Uh, but so even though she can't, doesn't like air conditioners, she actually had to buy one this past summer because it got so hot in Greece, just as it's getting so hot in places like India, that literally having an air conditioning is a matter of life and death. So, but she's a great, a great gal to have in that position in the United Nations. Uh, next, James Hamlin, superconductivity. Uh, he's a physicist that he debunked the claims of room temperature supercon superconductivity that some uh, scientists were trying to get by. Um, Svetlana Mas Majsov. Uh, she's basically she's the scientist who created the the uh, science behind the weight loss drugs like Ozempic and Wegovy. Um, I don't know if any of you are using those, but uh, these drugs work by suppressing people's appetites, and that actually can have some ecological benefit because you know if we eat less, particularly if we eat less meat. Um, we reduce agriculture's impact on the environment. Uh, let's see, then the last couple, uh, Halad, Halido Tinto, he's a fellow who has uh, come up with uh, a vaccine for malaria, and which is a great thing, you know, because malaria, there's 200 million cases of malaria in Africa every year, and about half a million people die from it every year in Africa. It's a little bit of a mixed um, bag, ecologically speaking, because one of the effects of malaria has been to keep people out of uh, certain areas in terms of, uh, it's protected, places that have high malaria have been protected from overdevelopment because people don't like to live there because they might get malaria. So if we ever come up with a, a completely effective malaria vaccine that could uh, and you know mean the end of some of the last wild places in Africa. So hopefully we'll be able to you know figure that out before then. But one of the things that this does demonstrate is that all the natural limits on humans, you know, on our population growth, on our spreading out on the planet, this past two centuries, the story has been us overcoming all those natural limits. And so it's not too surprising if, if we if we finally beat malaria too. But uh, right now his uh, vaccine is is 20% uh, effective and they're, they're working on, we're about to release one, I believe that's 40% effective. So still not 100%, but um, 
but uh, an important thing, an important development. A um, fellow named Thomas Powells, he was a cancer researcher. He came up with a, a good treatment for bladder cancer. And then the 10th, the last uh, of the of the nature's top 10 is chat GPT. <laughs> they chose chat GPT as one of their top 10 um, because of the, the way AI software is changing everything. And it's kind of an interesting question and uh, it has actually direct application right now because I, we just learned that Microsoft is um, using chat or using AI to fill out the paperwork for their new uh, small modular reactors with the, with the NRC. And if you're familiar with AI, <laughs> you know that one of the one of the big problems with it is that um, it could be completely wrong. And, and and put that put those completely wrong things out just as confidently and you know just as if they were completely right because AI actually has no idea whether it's right or wrong. It has no actual connection to reality. All it does is take words and mix them up and then like a word salad and serve it to people. So um, garbage in garbage out as they say. Right. And it can cause all kinds of problems. If the data going into it, AI has bias, then the information coming out will have bias if the data going in. And it just makes plausible sounding sentences. That's all AI does. And so to have AI filling out the details of a nuclear power plant application, um, could potentially be disastrous. And I'm, I'm hoping the NRC wises up to this and actually makes a regulation against using AI to fill these things out because they've got to be right. You know, AI, if you ask AI questions like simple math questions on like compounding interest and stuff, they it can give you a completely wrong answer. And so to do that with a nuclear power plant, if they start using these papers that the AI has generated to build their nuclear plant, it could melt down. Just oh frame. boy, yeah. All right, so that's uh, all I wanted to talk about in the first part of the show. And so now uh, let's hear from our advertisers and patrons. For a green future is brought to you by our patrons. These are wonderful people who've gone to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. There they searched for For a Green Future. Up popped our wonderful Patreon page that shows different levels of memberships and has a bunch of cool photos on it. There they picked the level of membership that matched their monthly budget. And every month, a little bit comes out of their account, comes over to us. And that's how we could afford to keep this show on the air. So we are extremely grateful to our patrons. And if you want to become one, just go to patreon.com and search for For a Green Future. Thank you. For a Green Future is also brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They also restore wildlife habitats and lead people on outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. There are several ways to get a hold of them and find out what's happening. One is to call them at 419 353 one eight nine seven. Another is to visit their website, www.wcparks.org. The website again is www.wcparks.org. They are also available on all social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and many others. Just search for WC Parks. That's the Wood County Park District, and we're very grateful for their support. Thanks again to our advertisers and patrons. And so, Rebecca, now it's your turn. Let's talk about sweet stuff. 
All righty. Well, coming up this weekend, as a matter of fact, uh, on Saturday, we are having National Chocolate Covered Anything Day. <laughs> and then Sunday is National Maple Syrup Day. Oh. Mm. It's right in time for Christmas, which is all about, you know, if, we, if there was a peppermint day on Monday, it'd be perfect, but there isn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, National. So I decided to do chocolate. Uh, chocolate is made from uh, co cocoa beans, or the, which are actually seed kernels. They're obviously not actual legumes. <laughs> uh, they look like beans, though, uh, which are dried and fermented. They come from the cacao tree, uh, also called the Thermobroma cacao, um, which is a 15 to 26 foot tall evergreen tree. Didn't know that. I, it's not like a pine tree, I don't think, but that's very interesting. I did not know that. And um, first, uh, they were first used as food by the Olmecs that we know of in the 19th to 11th century BCE. Reached Europe in the 1500s. I was going to uh, say, the Olmecs are in South America, right? Yeah, Mexico, I think. Pretty much Mexico. Okay. I could be. I think they're in the Nahuatl language group. I'm not really sure. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's used in liquid, solid, or paste form. And they do this by first fermenting it, then drying, uh, cleaning, and roasting the beans, shelling them to reveal something called nibs, chocolate nibs, which are um, ground to make uh, uh, cocoa uh, mass, and then liquefied by heating to produce chocolate li liqueur, I guess. And uh, that can be cooled and processed into cocoa solids and cocoa butter. So, yeah, um, ecological issues, there are a lot. Uh, oh. According to somebody called the Good Chocolate Tier website, uh, their, they, their uh, uh, cacao pump plantations are linked to deforestation and climate change uh, because trees, animals, and other plants are eliminated for the space to grow the trees, you know, the soil, and the nutrients. Um, the water is di diverted for the cacao trees. And all this causes erosion, sediment, and sediment in waterways. Um, now, the good chocolatier makes their living selling chocolate. So they seem to feel that sustainable practices can solve all this or what, at least help. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure how impeccable a source they are. They, they might have a vested interest in the, the idea that it is fixable by good management practices. But... According to them, something called uh, both both uh, rising demand and and something called black pod rot have forced uh, uh, farmers to abandon a lot of more sustainable practices like uh, shade growing. Traditionally, chocolate has, cacao trees have always been shade grown, and they're doing a lot of stuff like adding extra pesticides and you know cl clearing out more weeds. And, uh, you know, getting them out in the sunshine to promote faster growth, but it's not really sustainable. You know, it just, it uses everything up and leads to more soil contamination and herbicide resistance and stuff. Um, apparently, most of these, the two major areas for growing chocolate cacao trees are currently Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. They, they grow in tropical rainforests. And yeah, sun, the sun cultivation means clearing the overstory of the trees, which is why it's bad, kind of clearing out the tree canopy and whatnot. Um, the good news is they're mostly still small family farms, apparently. And uh, it says here that the price of beans is low, leading to more, that doesn't make sense, but they're, going, they're doing more intensive uh, farming to meet the demand. If demand is high, the price is supposed to go up. <laughs> so I'm yeah. not sure what's going on there. You know, maybe there's some some kind of chocolate cartel or something. But yeah, there, capitalism not working like it's supposed to, <laughs> as often happens. Yeah, th there is. There, I, I've seen documentaries that there is a chocolate cartel that the the companies that buy the raw chocolate from the farmers uh, basically collude to keep the price for the beans low. And and then they mark it up, you know, thousands and thousands of percent before they sell it, uh, before we can get it, a taste of it. So, so yeah, um, the invisible hand is behind somebody's back with a couple of fingers crossed is what's going on there. Yeah. So that's chocolate. Um, 
I don't really know, you know, if you did this, if you did it more sustainably, but the, you know, these people really feel like they're, they're making a choice, uh, a case, I guess, for buying the more expensive organically produced cocoa and knowing where your, your beans from come from and stuff. So, yeah. And then and on Sunday we have a maple syrup, um, Maple syrup likes to grow in uh, cold cli climates. Uh, the tree maple trees store starch in uh, trunks and roots before the winter, and then in late winter, early spring, it comes up in the sap to spread out uh, through the, uh, the rest of the tree in the xylem sap. Which uh, there's xylem and phloem, two types of sap. The xylem tissue is uh, is designed to conduct water and nutrients from the roots to the stems and leaves. So that's, it's, it's only got the one job and it's good at it. Um, they're made from, let's see, sugar, sugar maples, red maples, and black maples, apparently, most commonly. Hmm. Uh, originally invented by the Northeastern indigenous American peoples. Um, settlers changed up their methods a little bit. Uh, put Quebec is apparently the world's largest producer coming coming up with 70% of the world's maple syrup. So, wow. <laughs> mm. Yeah, Quebec is really going to town there. Um, apparently different countries and states have different, you know, it, you know, everywhere it has to be, have a certain level of sap content, but the sugar content varies from country to country and state to state, what it, how much sugar it can have, sucrose it can have, and be called maple, maple syrup or maple sugar, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Interestingly, nobody really completely understands the chemistry that produces the unique unique taste. So that's why if you buy fake maple syrup, it tastes like crap. <laughs> they don't know how to make the good stuff yet. Uh, it's used in baking as well as in cond as a condiment, which is nice. Um, occasionally, you can also make it from box elder maples, uh, big leaf maples, and Florida sugar maples. Um, I think maybe it's harder and slower and stuff, but you know, in a pinch, if you really, really want some, uh, you can also get syrup from birch, maple, and palm trees if you're really determined. <laughs> hmm. So, I don't know how that'd be an interesting project. Um, according to the USDA, most of the stuff I could find about maple trees and ecology is maple trees being affected by ecology. Um, I think because they are so sort of delicate and fiddly in the process, you know, is they, they they've not developed an express route to make maple syrup ever. It's it's mostly they don't really lend themselves to plantation agriculture <laughs> is what I'm getting at here. Maple trees are very sensitive to climate change, insects, drought or freeze thaw events, early frost, air pollution, invasive species, late frost, blah, 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 blah. Um so it's likely in the future that climate change will move production north and uh, shorten the sap collecting season, which is going to make it, you guessed it, even more expensive. It's already pretty expensive. Um, warmer temperatures, interestingly, tend to increase the amount of microbes and then clog the tap holes because there's too many microbes in them. All righty. Uh, less winters are also going to mean less snow. And snow actually helps insulate the 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 ground from freezing, so you know, ground freezing can kill roots and kill maple trees, which is bad. Um, the longer growing season could mean more maple trees, though, so maybe it'll balance out. They're thinking um, the sugar cr content apparently decreases with uh, temperature rise. So there's that. Uh, wind and ice storms also bad for maple trees, not great, and. Uh, it can hurt. Uh, I found out what sugar bush means here. Sugar bush is apparently a stand of trees, originally native sugaring camps. So it's it's a stand of maple trees that produce sugar. So mm -hmm. that's maple syrup. the 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 future is looking looking grim. Um, yeah. <laughs> enjoy it while you can, I guess. And yeah, that's just yeah, the, that alone is weight worth pretty much. You know instituting completely changing our way of life for if we could get yeah french toast my my uh my technician oh. is 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 having some kind of a seizure about french toast now oh yes yeah <laughs> that'd be terrible to lose french toast but the, yeah I, life is not worth living without french toast and maple syrup maple syrup you here, here. <laughs> we all know this i um my family uh one year our neighbors 
tapped a whole bunch of maple trees on our street that were in front of a graveyard. They didn't ask any permission. They just did it. And, uh, but they tapped them and they got a lot more sap than, than they could deal with. And so we also, since they had done it, we actually went and got some of that sap and, and drinking the straight sap before it's boiled down into uh, syrup. That was a really interesting hmm. taste. It was, it's, it was really very light and refreshing and uh, nice. that was cool. And then we made maple syrup, just kept heating it up and it and turned into syrup. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the neighbors didn't know what they were doing and they didn't seal up the holes they had made in the trees. Oh, and so they actually killed this, the, the whole stand of trees. And so, Oops, yeah, are very delicate and it's, it's very, yeah. you got to know what you're doing if you don't want to kill the trees, but uh, yeah, I don't want to lose maple syrup, but um, yeah, the maples are being forced further north. So, all right. Well, thank you, Rebecca. You're welcome. And now uh, we're going to go on to our ecological news. Our first story comes to us from the Santa Fe Mexican, Santa Fe, Santa Fe New Mexican. Um, it's a story on December 6th. And basically, it's a shameful story. The uh, U.S. House scraps proposal to expand radiation compensation to include New Mexico. And what this is, is um, there is a, a law that gives compensation to people who are suffering health effects like cancer and other diseases because uh, fallout from nuclear testing or you're working in uranium mines. And what happened was the house uh, under the current leadership just essentially said, no, the Senate had already passed this uh, 61 to 37 way back in July. It's called uh, RECA, the Radiation uh, Exposure Compensation Act. And so the, the Senate passed it because it just makes sense if you're going to have all these people that um, suffered from the government's programs to compensate them. And unfortunately, the Republicans uh, disagreed and they killed it in the House. So this is pretty shameful. And the only reason I can think of is that they don't want to admit, they don't want to basically talk about, they don't want to take responsibility for the fact that all this radioactive stuff they've dredged up or created by bombs or through mines uh, is dangerous. It is killing people. They want to just sort of pretend it doesn't. And so I think that's what was behind this uh, shameful act by the U.S. House. Okay, so we'll counter, counter that with a little bit of good news. This is from the Houston Chronicle, a uh, story by Dylan Bedor back on... Uh, last week. And uh, what's happened is Mid Max Midstream has applied to put in a new um, refinery down there. And the Texas agency that's responsible for overseeing refineries and stuff said that they didn't have to have any public hearings. They didn't have to have any um, public information or any public input to the decision because the, the ones who challenged it were shrimp fishermen who said that the shrimp fishery is going to be harmed. And the shrimp fishermen uh, lived more than a mile away from the, um, from the refinery. And Texas has had, it's not a, a rule because it was never put into any regulations. It's never been voted on. It's not in any law, but the, the, agency had just sort of decided over the years that you have to live out you have to live within a mile of any kind of development in order to have standing to to complain about it and so the the refinery company depended on this and challenged it and it got over overturned to court but this judge the, this federal this uh, Travis County District judge Amy Clark Meacham uh she basically came on board and said you know this this mile 
rule isn't based on anything except wanting to make it easier for polluters to pollute. So she it does the pollution know it's not allowed to go more than a mile <laughs> from the from the word from its source. Yeah, I don't know if they tell it on its way out of the smokestack, you know, so just stick <laughs> yeah. Don't go too far. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, so uh, so that's good news. So now there will be public hearing, and there'll be, you know, a chance to talk about, uh, you know, the possible effects and on the fishery and all that sort of stuff. So that's good news. Uh, now uh, on over to the UK. We rush over to the UK, and the Guardian has done a whole series of articles on the the radioactive danger by the nuclear industry there. And they have a, a story revealed, Sellafield nuclear site has leak that could pose risk to public. And essentially what they've got is this building that's housing uh, tons and tons of radioactive sludge. And it's got 22 concrete silos. Um, and what has happened is the radiation uh, it's so intensely radioactive that it is degrading the building. And uh, essentially now there's cracks showing up in the concrete and the asphalt that's supposed to contain this stuff. Uh, there's, there's joints are breaking and uh, this, is, this sludge has uh, wa radioactive water on top and then this really nasty you know, think the bottom of your sump pump kind of stuff underneath that, and all of it can flow, and all of it is leaking out. And it, if it, it could get into the groundwater, and this stuff, this particular uh, mixture of wastes can have, uh, can release radiation into the atmosphere, and it could, there could be explosions. And Whoa. if there's, yeah, Whoa. if, if there's, yeah, if there's explosions, uh, Norway, who, which is downwind from Sellafield, uh, thinks that there could be a plume of radioactive particles that could uh, basically wipe out Norway's ability to grow food or Whoa. have wildlife. So um, there was a senior Norwegian official who talked to the Guardian and they said that that they should, Norway wants to step in and help run Sellafield because it's being run so badly. Yeah. That <laughs> yeah. They're, they're afraid that they're going to, you know, they're going to suffer the consequences. So, uh, so just an interesting story. And, and this was harking, harkening back to our earlier discussion about sacrifice zones. Um, an important. Norway doesn't want to be one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Nuclear is the only source of energy that can turn an entire country into a sacrifice zone. Next story, uh, December 6th, uh, Amy Goodman, who has a program called Democracy Now!, she interviewed uh, a fella named Vladimir Sliv Slivyak, uh, and he was co-chair of Russia's leading environmental organization called Eco Defense, And he was talking about the fact that Russia and the U.S. Oh, the title of the story is Why Are Russia and U.S. Promoting Nuclear Power at U.N. Climate Talks? Russian Environmentalist Speaks Out. And basically, he's been forced to flee Russia because uh, Vladimir Putin doesn't like environmentalists. And he has a habit of killing people he doesn't like. So uh, he is operating. So this fellow, Vladimir Slivyak is operating from Germany, but he's saying very clearly, and here's a quote, when you promote nuclear power, you have to understand it's diverting resources from renewable energy, and renewable energy is the real most efficient answer to climate change. Right. And Russia is profiting off of climate change because Russia, you know, one of its main sources of income is uh, selling natural gas to other countries. Right. And another one of its main sources of income is selling uranium, <laughs> selling nuclear power plant fuel. Russia, you know, and the U.S. are supposed to be at odds, but when it comes to uh, nuclear energy, they, they were both pushing to have it put into the, the COP statement. And in fact, 
nuclear was listed in the COP, the final COP document, you know, the final statement of all the parties. COP stands for Conference of Parties. And so the final statement broke new grounds in that it does finally, after 28 years, call for a phase out of uh, fossil fuels. But then, unfortunately, it said, so we, we, we need to transition to other fuels like renewables. At least they listed renewables first. But then they listed right after renewables comes nuclear and then transition fossil fuels like natural gas, like you're going from coal to natural gas, and then a whole string of other really terrible technologies that have no, help, no chance of, of actually helping prevent uh, climate change. Moving on, another story, how wind turbines could coexist peacefully with bats and birds. The story, uh, November 8th by Katrina Zimmer in a Knowable magazine. And this story basically, uh, it's talking mostly about Australia. And they found that down in Australia, wind turbines kill uh, about four to six birds per turbine per year. That's higher than most other studies. Most other studies around the world, meta studies sh show it's about one bird per turbine per year. But um, the focus of this story is that there are a number of things you can do, uh, a number of technologies that will reduce that four to six per turbine per year even more. And they also talk about how uh, bats, they found that ultrasonic noises, we, we actually proposed this several years ago on this show, that ultrasonic noises can scare bats away from uh, wind turbines. Putting the, the bird and bat um, mortality in perspective, we're talking wind turbines kill, uh, you know, a, a, a ten, like a tenth of a percent compared to things like cats and uh, and large buildings like skyscrapers. Or let's talk about your car. Plenty of birds run into your car window, you know? Yeah, but cars kill many more, many more birds than wind turbines. So it's not perfect. You know, the, the bird and bat kill is not zero, but uh, there are technologies and wind, the wind industry has shown much more willingness to adapt to those technologies than um, many other industries like, you know, nuclear industry, for example. So, all right, next, on to the next story. <laughs> this is another aspect, another positive feedback loop, unfortunately. Um, this is a story in Yahoo News, December 10th. Estimated 2 billion tons of sand and dust are entering the atmosphere every year. We are in a vicious circle. Uh -oh. So basically what's happening is a desertification. So more and more areas in places like Africa and Asia are turning into desert from grassland. And um, United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification did a report and 25% of the, the storms sandstorms can be attributed to human activity like mining and grazing. And so what you get is this vicious circle where you you mine or you overgraze and you create a, a, a dead area. And so then the winds come and pick up the, the dust from that dead area and create a sandstorm. And then that sandstorm covers area around it wiping out the vegetation and increasing the size of the desert. And so then that creates an even larger area hmm. that you can put, pull your sand from for, for your sandstorm. And so the next sandstorm, you know, is even bigger. And so they got, we've got a positive feedback loop. And so there's things we can do, but, um, you know, controlling dust, land management, and there are examples, uh, China had uh, this exact problem with the Laozu area, the Laozu region, and they turned it around. They turned it from a dead, overgrazed um, area into a, what is now actually a lush and very productive agriculture area that has zero sandstorms. They used to have sandstorms every year. Well, thanks so much. Uh, this is Joe DeMar. And Rebecca Wood. We are signing off.